Mijoy go and Dijimidel, Seman Ongam, the the Mina goes in the Guijinian in Gego, when she was an Ishinabe can dasso in an Ejikinimin Seman the and the old up and non and old up and the Miguacho and down the Guijimin Guijimi. So just to acknowledge the tobacco that's come and to help provide some insight and understanding of what this tobacco is and these questions of what you're asking and what you're asking of me. So indigenous education uh, and from my own understanding and from my own lived experience is uh, is a transmission of uh, of knowledge, the transmission and transference of of a uh, of really specific knowledge that you can't really find anywhere in the mainstream education systems, which are which are life stories and that you can't get unless you've talked to somebody who's lived something or has done something along those lines. So it's very much a a their story, much like it's his story and history. Those are the, those are that's what I'm gonna try and reference. So that's um it's part of our education, and then understanding the 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 spirit of education. There's that there's a, a guidance there, and that's what as educators are they're supposed to do. So that's what I, I would I'd like to try and talk about, and um. So, uh, I'll, I'll talk about my own experience in in, in indigenous education. <laughs> so, me when me when you when you aman na Anishinaabe moin, I'm an a- actively pursuing the Anishinaabe language. Mirish gegin in the wakenda wa wakenda sinan. Well, when you can dance in Medewin, I'm learning all that I can. That is, of the Medewin society, the the way of the heart. Mirish gaining, also also helping with uh, my mom's school, the Nadamalget and and Nadamalget Mal Akinomotion Ejnekada. So uh, and um, and that. So when uh, help specifically with the language. You don't see it so much with other places of organ of uh, I guess education, mainstream education I should say, is uh, mentor apprenticeship programs. So that's actually taking the time and someone who would be designated the master of a specific art, language, or knowledge, and uh, spending time with them throughout. The course of however long it takes you to become proficient at it. So that uh, there's examples that down in in the southern U.S. with the Dene language, they do ma- master apprenticeship language uh, programs there, and they spend two hours a day for a week for three years learning the language. Yeah, well, that's what we're doing here. And we'll be doing here. So we have two uh, our two language speakers. They're from uh, Wiki, and their sisters, Cotney Gaboni and Mary Lou Manitowabi. That's who I'm learning language from. As well as uh, the but they're they're here every day with with the school and helping the school. But um, but there's a, there's a, like a, a learning helping agreement with the school for, uh, between uh, two organizations. Our my how to how to describe it we're a just a youth group <laughs> supposed to be a youth group <laughs> and uh we provide we were trying to provide funding to send youth and pay for a language teacher for a year and have them well well working with this and so we don't have to work look for a language teacher so that's that's going that's going pretty well but it's taking that time and uh listening and uh, once you start to understand 
then you ask questions. Because you don't want to just start asking questions right away. Because then you're not going to... It's going to take you a lot longer if you start asking right away. If you start asking right away, then another question, 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 then another question will come. So you got to really sit and wait and be patient because the questions, the answers will come. And it's, uh, you can find that anywhere in uh, indigenous systems because um, you hear this term often enough, but we're a spiritual people. And that's why the spirit of education is important as well. To remember that when you're when you're learning, uh, this may not actually be like a like a spirit, so to say, but there is something there, and I'm, but that's the only thing I can put a name to right now. But it's that it's believing in that, and believing in the in the spirit of intent as well that'll help you in your pursuing of, of knowledge. So that's also what indigenous education is. It's, it's the pursuit of knowledge, the knowledge, the knowledge, and it's the pers- and uh, understanding that. And to kind of provide a little bit more background specifically about knowledge. Knowledge is knowledge is ev- is in everything. There's uh, and that's to put it very broadly, like much like this question, but um, knowledge is understanding that how we are is understanding how we are all connected and how and where that connection comes from so for for uh within the last five years actually there's a saying that's that i've heard and that i really hold near and dear to my heart and in the language is and uh the best way to describe that is all that is of the spirit. But uh, that doesn't really quite make sense. So the best way to, and then, then another way to say that is uh, everything is sacred. But it's that connection that, and understanding why do we call spirit the creator. It's, uh, and then that goes back to uh, the creation story where the first time that the spirit is acknowledged aside from being the spirit is, uh, uh, how, how would I say it? There's, the, there's a full phrase to say it, but there's a shorter way. And then that means there is but one there is truly but one spirit that made everything. And then that helps you understand. By understanding that and understanding everything is sacred, you understand everything's connected because they all share that connection back to the spirit. And so that's the same thing with knowledge as well. It all You can all trace it back to the spirit. It doesn't have to be right from the... From the, from the from the creator itself. I don't, I don't really like that, <laughs> that that word because that's not all the spirit did. And the, the spirit continues to do more. So I'll just say the spirit. Because you once you trace that back to the spirit, you begin understanding knowledge a little better in an, in an indigenous concept, uh, not concept, but in an indigenous context. context yes frame of mind it was uh, it was another one <laughs> but once you get that you can begin to think about everything in a different way the closest thing to that i can say that uh in western terms is and uh this isn't a this isn't a, a uh i'm gonna reference say it. we we're all matter it's the same thing like everything is energy everything is in a state of energy. It's, th- it's a very similar concept. So, indigenous people understood that for thousands of years before Western science is just understanding that. So we all understood that that connection. That connection is what we need to focus on too when we're 
when we're learning. Because that uh, extends back through lineages, family lineages. So everybody has a family lineage. So it, uh, for myself, it would be, I have both my dad's Patagus lineage, and that could, can be traced all the way back to northern Wanapate area, and then my mom's Pegamagabal family lineage through her dad can be traced all the way back to the Georgian Bay area, and then, and then their moms and their dads and their so on and so forth. And I know a little more on my mom's side than I do on my dad's side, but that's because they, they kept those stories alive here, there. And it was a little harder here because everybody, uh, because of the lifestyles that people were living at the time, which would have been this uh, 80s, 70s, very post-residential um, school. For this region, anyways. But it's, and then that knowledge then can be traced back to you. So the way it's described is your grandparents, their grandparents, and then their grandparents seven generations back. And all lineages can be traced back to the spirit. So it's understanding that. So when you're acknowledging the grandfathers and grandmothers, what you're also acknowledging is you're acknowledging the spirit in that. So those lineages of knowledge can all be traced back. A lineage that has been that knowledge that has been carried by a family can be traced back, and then their transmission of that knowledge from generation to generation is the education, is the learning from the grandparents to the great grandparents. So the skills of hunting, the most relevant skills today would be hunting, fishing, uh, like setting nets. Uh, birch bark making and, and, and language language because uh, families have specific languages that their specific language use that they use and uh, it's a little more uh, there's variations from family to family and they'll sometimes argue about that but anyways that's how that's how we need to think about our education in an indigenous context is that it's a transmission from the lines. So when you take on knowledge from a line, you're taking on a family's knowledge too. So if you're learning language from someone, say, from Tamagami or out in Minnesota or elsewhere, you're taking on that family history and that family knowledge as well. Some of it. That may not be all of it, but it's that how that family would use that word in the context of a word that you'd be learning as a language learner. So that's Indigenous education. It's the transmission from family lineages that can be traced back to the spirit. In what ways do you personally pass on uh, the knowledge that you carry? So this is a good instance because I'm not just telling the recording and the people listening who would be listening to the recording. I'm also telling you, the interviewer. Or inter yeah, the interviewer. So... Because you, the interviewer, are also learning something from this, you're also going to relay that information through this recording. So this is this is one instance of a transmission and transference of knowledge. So that's uh, that's all, and I guess that's uh, how you got to look at the tobacco too. Is what's in the requ in the request. So so yeah, so this is that's an example. But in my own case of transfer uh, transferring knowledge to kids is. So working at my mom's school, Kinemo Shin, we, uh, we're a land-based program, and we're trying to do everything we can with the kids on the land. Of course, it gets really cold, and then they can't stay out too long, and they just freeze. But I just say, I'm ready to say, just suck it up and stick them in a snowbank. <laughs> the snow's deep enough to keep you warm. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but, but they, some, of them, some of them manage, and some of them are having having really good times while they're here and they're out exercising and they're living on the land and they're doing what their grandparents would have done generations ago. So that's, that's what I'm helping teach as well as not only catching language from the language teachers, but I'm also using that language that I'm learning from them and using it with the children. So there, that's the transmission of knowledge right, as well and transference, but also, um, 
we we actually take quite a few professional development days, even though they're not quite, they wouldn't be a standard professional development, but when you apply the, uh, I guess, indigenous context, <laughs> when you apply it to professional development, um, you can really see how anything can thus be professional development. But... Uh, specifically ceremonies are a good example of that because I'm actually taking time out of my day, my week to go and listen to to uh, the conductors of, or the leaders of the ceremony I don't, I don't conductors and um, take that time to learn from them how to how they do it and then learning how to do it so it's observation and then and then not only that you're helping them because they can't all, they can't do it all by themselves so you, they're going to they need help so that's that's what I'm that's what I personally what I'm doing and then but we get quite a few of those to go actually listen actually sit and listen and then and then they're all you're always asked to like think think a little more about that or if you're stuck on something just to be patient, because the answer will come. And remembering that to have that respect for uh, the spirit, because the spirit can always answer. Because if you're, I was, I had like my in my own personal experience, I've had instances where I've th- been thinking about something and thinking about something, and then I've uh, when I say I, I'm dreaming, I'll be shown something. That's it's a good time when the spirit has answered you. So that's that's one one instance. Language is uh, another thing is very key and it's very critical. We're at a critical time. It, it's uh, it's almost at a point where you should drop everything and just focus on language. But if you dropped everything and focused on language, you couldn't live. And it's already hard enough to make a living on language. <laughs> but all the old people and... Uh, they they and when I've noticed this and when I've talked to them, they said I'm very proud of you for beginning to speak, to begin to understand. Cause uh, it wasn't it wasn't two generations back where my grandparents were getting hack in Ojibwe. And my great grandfather said to said to my grandma actually, I don't know why I bother to speak to you. In English, because if I speak to you in Ojibwe, you don't understand it. You only, you know, like you don't understand either way I tell you. <laughs> and that's and that's all I can think about is my the family going back to the family lineage is how how proud they would be, to, and not just myself, but all the family lineages, how proud they would be to see their their five times great grandchild speaking the language and then they go back and it goes back and how proud that that would that would be because uh that's also an act of healing is to reclaim what's yours i hate to say reclaim it's another good one revitalize <laughs> to to pick that up again to pick up those uh those knowledge systems and those systems of of understanding that they understood and they used that to see their grandchildren pick that up again would be very moving for them so that's where that's what I, that's what those are my thoughts on language as well and how to the point we're at. But I guess that kind of goes into like what stories are teaching for you, like your grandchildren, great grandchildren to be able to hear you talk about. So I know myself, I've, I'm going to, I'm going to do a short little, I guess, story history is that, um, so my mom's adopted father is, um, Eddie Benton Benet. And, uh, he is one of the last interpreters of Birchbark Scrolls. He's one of the last carriers of the creation story songs that go with the creation story. He's one of the last people to uh, to fully know the the knowledge 
in its fullness or as full in this time. So in this in this time frame, because he had teachers when he was growing up too, and they had knowledge bundles that were more full. But now we're coming to a point where it's getting sm- it's not getting smaller but it's it's there but it's it, it won't physically be available so that would be that would be my mom and then that and myself so and my sisters my all and then all his other grandchildren as well and his other daughters his other children so those creation story songs and then the knowledge of that bundle I'm sure he would love to see be passed on, but he's at a stage in his health where it's really hard to arrange anything like that. So those might just go with him when the time comes. But they can always come back. They can always find a way back, and that's okay. You got. I don't want to say you, sh- you need to be okay with that, but it- it's okay if it happens or it doesn't happen. Because you you need to just understand it. And uh, it being uh, some the stories you need to be you need to understand what's being said to you and in, in a sense, I know out west not so much here but out west when they speak language it sounds very musical, so it would sound like they're singing a song to you and they would sing back and forth, and if you if you listened to that you they'd be con- it's it's like they're conveying a full concept to to one another in the through a song and that's how it's said is that. A song is a concept you're trying to tell someone. So that's how that language is, and that's how those songs are, is they're trying to convey a concept and an understanding to you. So one of the first... The first song my adoptive grandfather sang, sang the first creation... I won't sing it over the recording, but <laughs> uh, the words I'll give anyways, because the words are the words. You can't... You, you're... As much as you can find the tune, you're probably not going to find the tune. But it, it was like, the words were, Nanin Iwezian, Nanin Iwezian Enanemon. What the, the uh, concept is conveying is that, am I alone? It's almost like a, a singular... The way it was described was it's, it's the recognition that I might be alone because that's that's the first song in creation and you may have heard the uh Jim Dumont talk about the creation story or there was a meme one time and it went around on Facebook and it said in the how do you like your coffee and it said in the beginning before the beginning there was darkness <laughs> that's where you can that's where you can place that song is that before there was anything that's what you're that's what that song is saying there, there, there became a self awareness in the darkness. So, like, so like th- those songs, those songs won't, uh, most likely won't be passed on. They've been a lot of them have been sung. His son recounted that forty three of the sixty, I think it's sixty four songs have been sung in this time. So, or that he's heard, anyways, that that, that the son has heard. That's the, he's heard forty three or something like that. So 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 you you have what you have and you can't you can't change that. <laughs> there's other examples of uh, transference of knowledge. Uh, there's another man who comes from uh, Minnesota and his name's I don't know if you've heard Lee Staples. You know the name, yeah. Okay, because he he has a book that, about how to do funerals like traditional funerals, traditional Anishinaabe funerals. And I, I, w- I really want that book, but I, I can't order it on Amazon. <laughs> but uh, he... It's interesting, though, because it carries, from my understanding, is it carries a lot of the knowledge on what needs to be done for uh, Anishinaabe when, when they pass away. But no tobacco was was offered in, in, from what I can understand. And that's an interesting circumstance because that's knowledge just being put out there. But at the same time, it's he's concerned about the people who maybe aren't being, best way to say this, is sent home in the proper manner. 
that's how I understand how he why he wrote those books. And uh, it's hard enough to uh, find find a, a conductor of, of of those ceremonies, for example, funeral ceremonies, funeral uh, rites, because they don't have to happen often enough. There might be a big a big a big uh, resurgence of them now that people are beginning to uh, want to live a more or want to be more I guess the the phrase is traditional they want to be more traditional <laughs> and um so so for them that that book would be a good example for wanting to learn so so things that need that that I would like to know <laughs> things that need to pass on is uh would be like extend being able to extend and have that the right to extend people into societies. So whether it's like Sundance, Medewin, Wabano, or any other society, societal lodge or medicine lodge is to have those rights transferred and continue as well as um, the rights, funeral rights, because if you don't, you can, and uh, it was explained this past funeral for uh, Josephine Mandaman is that you may although you may know the rights in life and you may know what's coming up in life as a spirit it'll be the first time you're hearing them because that's how that that, that change is described is you're not you're going from physical to a spirit spiritual physical life to spiritual life in that transition of death so that's how that so it, so that's that's why it's important for those rights get passed on and then and then of course there's other life event things that should happen too those kind of rights need to happen and should continue but it that's easier because there's a lot of younger people and it, it can happen it happens it's happening more often you see lots of people doing their very fast vision quests first hunt things like those so I'm not I'm not too concerned about those ones in particular. I'm concerned about the very specific and not done very often <laughs> stories and rituals and rites that happen. So. So, what is your vision for indigenous education for the next ten years? It's, it's hard. Uh, that's a it's a hard one to say. It's kind of, people have been answering in kind of these two waves of, like, what they fear in, like, I guess, a more realistic view of what's been going on, what continues, and then there's been that more, like, um, what they hope for. Oh. So if you want to, like, double whammy it, or if you wanted to just share it as you see that question. It really depends on how Indigenous people want to assert sovereignty over themselves that's how i vision educational go so that that again that's very that's two very two very different ways it can be we'll continue to be supported from INAC we'll end look for those don't that handout from the government to continue funding our kids to go to public school ontario school and post-secondary and it'll it can continue can continue as long as as long as the sun will shine and the rivers flow you know back going back to the treaties that's it can continue that long if we allow it and um uh, you know it's not a bad it's and people always have this idea and because it's been probably ingrained on them it's, i know it was ingrained on my grandparents to be just like the white man and then my mom took that on us too. You gotta be, you gotta be a good student. You gotta work hard. But I was never a good student. <laughs> I'm okay at best. But the vision then is: do we continue down the same road, status quo, receiving support from the government, or do we take our education into our own hands? And uh, and really start supporting, cere- like the fullness of what I just talked about: ceremony, language, the stories, and then 
hunt, even hunting and using the land is education. And really take that science and math and everything else that the, that I guess the government and government curriculum, if people are really concerned about that, we can find ways to, I don't want to say like insert it, but include it in a, in a way that it's not the focus, but it'll be there if ever they want to go back to, to mainstream education. So that's how, that's what I'm thinking. That will always be there. Mainstream education will always be there. Indigenous education won't always be there. So it's up to the people to recognize that and to want to pursue that. I can't, you can't, you can't make anybody do that. You can make them, you can make it known and it's up to them. <laughs>